Uh, really loving some Elisha the last couple weeks if you've been uh, figuring it out. So much I wanted to stay with him again. And uh, we started out when Elijah began to hand off the, the baton to him. And now, you know, Elijah's rode the fiery chariot up, up in heaven. And now Elisha, uh, his ministry is rolling. So if you would, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings. We're going to look at chapter 5, and we'll look at uh, verses 1 through 14. So 2 Kings 5, verses 1 through 14. I'll give you a little, little extra time to find that, because that can be... It's not one of the books you might read a lot. It's part way through the... You there? You there, Tracy? You find it? Right past 1 Kings. I found it. Yeah, it's right after 1 Kings. Yeah, yeah. 2 Kings chapter 5. So starting in verse 1, it says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and they had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. I'm going to stop for a moment. Understand the desperation this guy must be going through? I mean, he's a great soldier. He's conquered all these other armies. He's a tough guy. He's used to being in charge. All of these things that we associate with our typical alpha males, if you will, his skin is rotting off his bones. And how frustrating he must be to where he's going to take the advice of a slave girl to get help. Moving on. Matthew, by all means, go, the king of Abram replied, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, and taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. And the letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. So here's the king, right? <laughs> Guy rolls up, this mighty general. He's got this letter and he's got all these gifts. And all you got to do is cure him of leprosy. <laughs> oh, I cure people. That's not me. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and he said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of this leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. And when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Stopping for a moment, what is a prophet of God? One who foretells the future and says what's going to happen? Not necessarily. Someone who speaks for God, basically. Someone who simply speaks for God. A prophet doesn't necessarily have to foretell the future. A prophet is simply a spokesperson for God. An incredible honor and incredible responsibility. But not a fortune teller. Okay? And that's what Elisha wanted. He wanted to be known that there was someone in Israel who was speaking for God, not for Baal. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him. Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Okay, so Naaman got his answer, right? He got to the right guy. He's not happy. This isn't how he wanted his prayer answered. Ooh, think about that, guys. Sounds how like often have you done that, huh? Mm, you pray to God, and... He answers your prayer, but not the way you wanted, the, you wanted it done. He, not being done the way you saw it coming, so you get angry. Mm -hmm. Naaman got ruined. Verse 11 says, But Naaman went away angry, and he said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure my leprosy. <laughs> not only did Naaman want cured, he wanted cured his way. 
Are not Abana and Farfar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and he went off in a rage. Because it's in our temper fits, in our little tantrums, in these moments of rage, that we do the smartest things we've ever done in our lives, right? Amen. Right. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself into Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. I read a true story about a man, and I know it's true because I've been there myself. He went to the hardware store for supplies he needed for a minor plumbing repair. <laughs> there we go. You see where this is going, right? And as he was leaving, the owner said, I'll see you in a little while. <laughs> so, why the customer asked is there something else I need he said no you haven't forgotten anything he replied it's just that every do it yourself or who does a plumbing job they mess things up and they come back a couple times at least three trips to the hardware store well the man said I plan to be the exception <laughs> an hour later he's back <laughs> he had to get a replacement for a part that he damaged the owner Looked him over, held up two fingers, and said, I'll see you in a little while. <laughs> well, the customer said, they did not see me in a little while. When the predicted third trip became necessary, I went to a different hardware store. <laughs> <laughs> Pride. It's an interesting weakness because we're proud of being proud and we're ashamed of being proud at the same time. You ever notice yourself doing that? It's like two guys fighting over who's more humble than the other. And it just continues. It's a stupidity, but it's a very interesting little sin. It causes us to do or, or to not do all kinds of crazy things in our lives. A commentator named William Barclay, he once said that pride is the ground in which all other sins grow. And Barclay got his wisdom from this scripture in, in Proverbs 11.2. 11, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. One thing that God is quick to give you is humility. God can humble you so quickly. Oh, you don't see it coming. Proverbs 16, 18 said, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And James 4, 6 really drives it home. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And in our text today, we meet a very proud man. Now, you wouldn't think that he was proud when you are first introduced to him. He just seems to be very successful. He's important. He's skilled. And he seems to be very well liked. His name's Naaman. One man described Naaman this way. He was the commander of a very powerful army. Men took orders from him. Men feared him. Men showed him respect and honor. He had a position that other men only dreamed of having. He was powerful and he was popular. He had a good name, he was trusted, he was respected. And he was respected and trusted even by his king. And that was unheard of in those days. So this guy is important and he's almost like he gets used to being important. And that is such an easy trap for us to fall into. Most military leaders were feared by the kings. And, and so he was, he was powerful, he was popular, and he was accomplished. He was a man of great valor, and he had won many battles. He was, he was a man that a mother would be proud to call her son. The ultimate success story. A leader of men. Capable, respected, well-liked. But he had a problem. He had leprosy. It's a horrible, degenerative disease. And in some parts of the world, it's still active. And you know, it just starts off with a little spot. And eventually your skin just rots off your bones. It's a horrible, horrible thing. They use the term in the Bible, unclean. He was unclean. 
and it wouldn't just go away. So I'm convinced that every time I get sick, it'll just go away. Right. This wasn't going to just go away. He was going to die, and it would take a while. Now, Romans 15, 4, it tells us that what was written in the Old Testament was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Amen. So in other words, there's a reason why God is telling us this story. And, and all of these Old Testament stories are written there for that reason. To give us hope. To see what situations these men and women of God went through and were able to, to come out ahead. Hope. And there's something about the healing of Naaman's leprosy that God wants us to see. Now, I don't anticipate that any of us in this room will ever have leprosy. I think that's a really safe bet to say none of us ever have. Okay? And in the Bible, leprosy was used a lot of times as a symbol of sin. It, it was like, it was a disease that you could not hide. It, and it devastated their lives. It destroyed them from the inside out. It separated them from their families. It separated them from God. It separated them from other people. They became literal outcasts. And, and that is what sin can do to us. And this is what leprosy was going to do to Naaman. But God healed Naaman of his leprosy. And, and, and you see, the story of how God healed Naaman, I want us to see that as a very powerful lesson how God, God uses us to bring healing to the sin-sick souls of the lost. So think about Naaman, first of all. Okay, because now here he is, powerful general, the man. The tragic knowledge of his life is ruined. And the first person to give him hope is a slave girl. Notice where, think about her. She wasn't important, she wasn't influential, she was not a great theologian. She was just a slave. But yet it was her advice that got Naaman looking for God. And think about this girl. She didn't volunteer to be there. She, she was taken captive. She was kidnapped. She was stolen away from her family. Maybe her family was killed. We don't know. She was taken away to the southern land. She was not part of this. Why did she care about Naaman? Let him die. Teach him to make me a slave. To be honest with you, that's probably the attitude I would have taken. And good. He's going to get what he deserves. God's getting him back. God's getting him for me. <laughs> Snatch me away. Change my life. Make me do this. Yeah, there you go. How about that person? Because that's not what she does, does it? She understood that she was put where she was for a very specific reason. And rather than enjoy a little bit of petty revenge, this unnamed girl allows herself to be used by God in a powerful way. Amen. 2 Kings 5, 3 and 4 says, She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and he told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. She couldn't do much, but she did what she could. And she gave Naaman hope. I've used this story before about, you know, the depressed salesman. And he breaks things off. He said, I'm having a hard time getting sales. I can't get people to buy my product. And he went to a man. He respected and shared his troubles. And he said to his friend, I guess he just, he can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And his friend smiled and said, son, your job isn't to make them drink. Your job is to make them thirsty. And that's what this slave girl did. She made Naaman thirsty for God. You see, when we have a friend who is struggling, a lot of times that's all they need. They don't need you to tell them how to live their lives. They don't need for you to tell them what they need to do to fix themselves. They certainly don't need berated and, and beat up. They need Jesus. And it, letting them see that they need Jesus does not require that you be a theologian. This 
slave girl probably couldn't even read, okay? You don't have to be a great speaker. You don't have to be a great teacher. You need to know three things. You need to know your friend has a problem. Two is you need to believe that Jesus can fix that problem and give them hope. And thirdly, speak up and tell them about Jesus. And, and, and I caution you, don't make promises for God. Don't tell your friend who's struggling what God will do for them. Tell them what God has done for you. Amen. All right. Amen. And let them draw that conclusion. That's all it takes to make people thirsty for God. If you're willing to do that, you can change someone's life for all of eternity. Amen. Think about that. Exactly. For all of eternity, you can save that life. Think about making a difference. Huh? Friend came over to your house and it was thirsty. Would you toss him a bottle of cold water? Sure. How much more important would this be? Mm. Think about that. So David goes looking for God, right? And that's when he visits Elisha. Now, bear in mind, David's an important man. He's come to Elisha's courtyard, and when he would have arrived, it would have not been difficult to understand he was an important guy. This is not a single rider on a horse or a guy walking, even like one guy in a chariot, okay? This would have been what we would call today, you know, a big time motorcade. He's come to Elijah's courtyard, military guard of horses, several chariots. You can hear them from miles away. The hoof beats, the chariot wheels, the, you can probably even feel it as they got closer. When he rolled up there, it was a big deal. Okay? Naaman knows that Elisha knows he's coming. He's wealthy, he's powerful, he's a leader of men. He's used to being listened to. He's come bearing expensive gifts of gold and silver and precious garments. And he's come to the home of a simple prophet. You see, I can imagine Naaman in his mind thinking that he is doing this prophet a favor. <laughs> hey, think about it. If this prophet can heal me, he could be famous. Because, you know, he's not healing regular common people anymore. Now he's healing me. He's healing me. <laughs> what a privilege and honor this is for him. And he's expecting that Elisha would come out and be, oh, the great Naaman, huh? So it's my pleasure, it's my honor, please. You know, Elisha doesn't even show up. He sends a spokesperson out the door. Naaman expects Elisha to be impressed. He expects Elisha to be honored to receive him. And he expects Elisha to render under him the deference that he deserves. But that doesn't happen. Remember a couple sermons ago, Elisha has seen chariots of fire. Elisha has seen things that are impressive. Some, some general on a horse with leprosy, it doesn't compare to what he just saw a few weeks ago. Elisha doesn't come out to meet him. Instead, Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored, and you shall be clean. And that's it. End of the interview. Not what Naaman saw coming. And he is furious. How dare this petty prophet treat him this way? Who does he think he is? So in anger, Naaman shouts out, I thought he would surely come out to me, stand and call upon the name of the Lord and, and, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. <laughs> he talks about the rivers in his, own home, in his own country, how beautiful they are compared to the Jordan. Now, many of us, sometimes we romanticize the river Jordan. We think about it, we think of it. So when Jesus was baptized, and John the Baptist baptizing in the river Jordan, and you know, we hear all these stories. The River Jordan is not impressive. It's not deep. It's muddy. It's not, it's not pretty. It's just, it's there. And granted, it was used greatly by God. But as far as 
scenic wonders, it would not make the top 100 list. Okay? And he is so angry. What am I going to do? Go down here? These goofy Israelites are probably standing there fishing in the river trying to catch out important fish they think is going to change their life. Ain't nobody down there fishing. Ain't nobody down there. I'm certainly not going to be down there dipping myself in it. I deserve better than that. I'm Damon. He goes and he turns and he just stomps off in a rage. And I want you to notice what happens next. Because God has surrounded this man with so many important support people in his life. So he had the, the little servant girl who got this whole thing started. But now his servants, they come near and they speak to him. Now they could have easily said, you know what, if he's going to be stubborn and bullheaded, good, man. Tough. We came out here with you. We brought it to you. You aren't going to take advantage of it. We can't help you. That's not what they do. They go in unto him. They talk to him. It says they came here and they said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? One of the things we don't talk a lot about, and it doesn't get mentioned much, is all these gifts that David brought. With him, that he was going to buy his own by favor from God, by favor from this prophet, that this prophet would be would need the money, would, would accept all these expensive gifts, and that that would be what leveraged him to help him. Not a good place. That doesn't even come up, though. And keep in mind, these servants of Naaman, they were pagans. They worshipped foreign gods. They knew very little of the God of Israel. But yet God used them to speak to Naaman. And, and here's my point. So it's true that Romans 10, 14 tells us how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? You see, in other words, there are people out there who need to hear us talk about Jesus. And they won't hear about him unless we speak about him. Amen. Sure. And it's only logical because we supposedly belong to him. Of course we're going to speak about him. But we're losing ground in our country. In a recent survey, 43% of our younger people stated that they either don't know, they know or they don't care, or they don't believe that God exists. <coughs> about that. Even exists. They don't know, they don't believe, or they don't care. It sounds intimidating until you think of it maybe from a different angle. Because years ago, I read, I used to read a lot about Abraham Lincoln, but one of his aides was worried that the majority of the Northerners disagreed with some of Lincoln's policies. And the aide tried to convince Lincoln to change his mind, abandon the policy, and, and Lincoln replied, they disagree with me? That means I have to do a better job of explaining it to them. Mm -hmm. Lincoln was convinced he was right. And he wasn't going to quit talking about it until he convinced those who disagreed with him that he was right. And, and in the same way, we as God's people, we have to understand there are going to be people who do disagree with us. Not everybody, even among, even within our own church, we disagree on, the, you know, on some of the modern, modern theological principles and points and theories like that. Within the church, the universal church, there's a lot of disagreement with things. But in the community, there's a lot of people who don't even believe God exists. People reject Jesus, they ignore God. They don't want Scripture to have any influence in their lives. And we as Christians must understand this. For somebody to come to God, it's so much more difficult than changing the, your sports team alliance or something like that. Because when you come to God, you're going to change. And you have to accept that you're going to change. And you're going to have to get rid of the garbage in your life to get the treasure that God wants to give you. You can't have both. Amen. Amen. Amen, for sure. So there's going to be opposition. People don't want to change. Even when it's good for them, they don't want to change. There's always going to be people like that. But like Lincoln, we must be convinced that it is up to us. 
God said it. We know it's right. We have to refuse to shut up. And we need to do the best we can. We must be committed to explaining God to them and never quit. Their eternity is in balance. And like I said, I'm not telling you to argue over theological points. Get into fights over what types of baptism are best. You know, or, you know, whether you, have, you can wear a hat inside a church building or not. Or you can do this, or can men have long hair? Can be... <laughs> those are the kind of things that infuriate you when Christians get tied up in those petty little arguments. I was with a previous denomination and we, they, they sent all of us to this big resort one time in uh, Northeast Maryland. That was the name of the town was Northeast. And then we were there and it was beautiful. It was right on the cove. And they spent a fortune. They sent all the pastors, all the church clerks, and I think and all the officials and everything else. And the first day, at the beginning of the session, one of the guys brought up the fact that they should have abandoned baptism by sprinkling and go to baptism by full immersion. <laughs> At that time, I, I, I kept my Baptist credentials, so I believed in that wholeheartedly. But it started a rumble throughout this group. And they spent the entire day arguing about it. They did. I left after about half an hour and went fishing. <laughs> That's it. I came back, they were still fighting about it. I caught a couple fish, I had a good day. You know? <laughs> you know, you see so many people are turned off from Christianity by seeing those petty little arguments. I can get those arguments at the Moose. I can get those arguments at the Sons of Italy. I can get those arguments at the Bowling League, whatever. Right? Why is this any different? Because <laughs> Do what matters for God. Share hope to people who are living hopeless lives. Amen. That's what matters. Like that little slave girl, we need to understand sometimes all we can do is say what we can. And then we trust God to do the rest. And God can do it because he's not limited by our weaknesses, by our abilities or our wisdom. You realize that when it came to naming obeying God and being baptized in the Jordan River, it was not the slave girl that convinced him to do that. It wasn't Elisha who convinced him to do that. It was his pagan friends. But they all took a role, didn't they? The slave girl brought it up. We like to use the term planted the seed, if you will. Mm -hmm. The slave girl brought that up. Then along came Elisha did his role according to what God had him do. But it was the friends, those who had a relationship with him, who convinced him to do what God needed him to do. Those of us who have non-Christian friends should be impacted greatly by this story today. That is what God is calling us to do. The slave girl and Elisha did their part, but it was God who made the difference, working through those pagan friends. So we need to take and trust God to use our meager efforts to change people's lives. You should do your part and then trust God to do the rest. Remember, the Holy Spirit works through you. You are not the Holy Spirit. Amen. And one last thought. Naaman came to Elisha for healing. But it was not Elisha who healed Naaman. It was God. In fact, that's what Elisha's name means. That's what's so beautiful. It means, my God is salvation. Amen. Mm -hmm. In other words, salvation came from God. Everything, everything in this story is pointing to that truth. Everything in Elisha's ministry points to that truth, mm -hmm. including how he treated Naaman. You realize there are people who wouldn't have handled Naaman like Elisha did. They would have been more seeker-friendly. They would have been more understanding of Naaman's sensibilities. Maybe they would have had a 10-point lesson on all the advantages of doing things God's way. But instead, Elisha recognized this quickly. And he refused to cater to, to Naaman's pride. And he ended up making him mad. But Elisha made it clear that he was not the one doing the healing. He didn't even tell him directly. He sent a messenger. It appears that Naaman never even set eyes on Elisha. 
And Elisha's actions literally drove this guy away. And David could have died of his leprosy, faced with eternal damnation. Now, now why would Elisha do that? Why offend Naaman? What was the point? And he did that, though, because it wasn't his message. See, it was God's message. When John the Baptist preached the message, what did he say? Remember? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus, in Matthew 4, 17, had the same message. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. When God started the church at Pentecost, remember Peter's words? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Over and over again, it's the same message. We need to repent. Whether it's pride or lust or selfishness or greed, whatever, you've sinned and you're going to hell, repent. You can't come to God on your terms. Amen. Naaman couldn't come to God on his terms. It couldn't be done his way. You have to come to God on his. Amen. Do what God tells you to be healed. Mm -hmm. He complained that the water was dirty. This isn't how I want it. We have cleaner rivers back home. He was too proud to do things God's way, and it almost cost him his life. But yet eventually he obeyed God and he became clean. All he had to do was go dip in the river seven times. How hard was that? I remember one time talking with a guy. He was troubled. He had a lot of life as a mess. Family gone, he had driven them all away. All he did was drink. Had owed people everything. Didn't, you know, had nothing to speak of in, in the world. And I was talking to him about Jesus. And he said to me, he said, this guy was really rough around the edges. He was a real tough guy, if you will. And he said, I guess I'm just too proud to admit that I need God. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, buddy, you're my friend. But look around. What are you so proud of? And it shook him. And he turned to Christ. Amen. Amen. So think about that. What are we really so proud of? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much that we can call ourselves yours. And Lord, we thank you that you have done so many things in our lives that we can share with others who need this love and need this help. We pray, dear God, that you will give us that opportunity to reach someone in your name. Lord, as we see our friends and we see them struggling, God, give us that. Give us the words to say, not to berate them and not to beat them into submission to you, but to Lord, make them thirsty for you. Give us the sense to know and to stay out of your way and just be a part of you moving. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.